Hello, and welcome back to Prairie Story Readings. It has been a good year and some odd months since my last Prairie Story Readings upload, um, but this is the only book that I have with me, so I figured I might as well finish reading it for you all. The Living Mountain by Nan Shepherd. Part one, the plateau, can be found farther back uh, on my channel or under Prairie Story Readings playlist. Today we'll be reading part two, The Recesses. And apologies because I don't speak Gaelic and I am probably mispronouncing these words, but it is a beautiful language that deserves to be spoken properly. Um, so feel free to look up these words on your in your own time. And as I begin to learn Gaelic myself, hopefully the pronunciation will become more accurate. At first, mad to recover the tang of height, I made always for the summits, and would not take time to explore the recesses. But late one September, I went on Brariac with a man who knew the hill better than I did then, and he took me aside into Cour on Lochen. One could not have asked a fitter day for the first vision of this rare loch. The equinoctial storms had been severe. Snow that hardly ever fails to powder the plateau about the third week of September had fallen close and thick. But now the storms had passed. The air was keen and buoyant with a brilliancy as of ice. The waters of the loch were frost cold to the fingers. And how still how incredibly withdrawn and tranquil. Climb as often as you will, Loch Cor and Lochen remains incredible. It cannot be seen until one stands almost on its lip, but only height hides it. Unlike Avon and Etchichen, Etchichen, it is not shut into the mountain, but lives on an outer flank its hollow ranged daily by all the eyes that look at the Cairngorms from the spay. Yet, without knowing, one would not guess its presence, and certainly not its size. Two cataracts, the one that feeds it, falling from the brim of the plateau over a rock, and the one that drains it, show as white threads on the mountain. Having scrambled up the bed of the ladder, not, as I knew later, the simple way, but my companion was a rabid naturalist who had business with every leaf, stalk, and root in the rocky bed. One expects to be near the quarry, but no, it is still a long way off. And on one toils into the hill. Black scatter of rock, pieces large as a house, pieces edged like a grater, a tough bit of going. And there at last is the loch, held tight back against the precipice. Yet as I turned that September day and looked back through the clear air, I could see straight out to ranges of distant hills. And that astonished me, to be so open and yet so secret. Its anonymity, loch of the quarry of the loch, that it is all, seems to guard this surprising secrecy. Other lochs, Avon, Morlick, and the rest have their distinctive names. One expects of them an idiosyncrasy. But Loch of the Cory of the Loch, what could there be there? A tarn like any other. And then to find this distillation of loveliness. I put my fingers in the water and found it cold. I listened to the waterfall until I no longer heard it. I let my eyes travel from shore to shore very slowly and was amazed at the width of the water. How could I have foreseen so large a loch, three thousand odd feet up, slipped away into this quarry, which was only one of three upon one face of a mountain that was itself only a broken bit of a plateau. And a second time, I let my eyes travel over the surface, slowly from shore to shore, beginning at my feet 
and ending against the precipice. There is no way like that for savoring the extent of a water surface. This changing of focus in the eye, moving the eye itself when looking at things that do not move, deepens one's sense of outer reality. Then static things may be caught in the very act of the becoming. By so simple a matter, too, as altering the position of one's head, a different kind of world may be made to appear. Lay the head down, or better still, face away from what you look at, and bend with straddled legs till you see your world upside down. How new it has become. From the close by sprigs of heather to the most distant fold of the land, each detail stands erect in its own validity. In no other way have I seen of my own unaided sight that the earth is round. As I watch, it arches its back, and each layer of landscape bristles, though bristles is a word of too much commotion for it. Details are no longer part of a grouping in a picture of which I am the focal point. The focal point is everywhere. Nothing has reference to me, the looker. This is how the earth must see itself. So I looked slowly across the core lock and began to understand that haste can do nothing with these hills. I knew when I had looked for a long time that I had hardly begun to see. So with Loch Avon, my first encounter was sharp and astringent and had, has crystallized forever for me some innermost inaccessibility. I had climbed all six of the major summits, some of them twice over, before clambering down into the mountain trough that holds Loch Avon. This loch lies at an altitude of some 2,300 feet, but its banks soar up for another 1,500. Indeed, farther, for Karen Gorm and Ben Makhdui may be said to be its banks. From the lower end of this mile and a half gash in the rock, exit is easy but very long. One may go down by the Avon itself through 10 miles as lonely and unvisited as anything in the Karen Gorms, to Incrory, or by easy enough watersheds pass into Strathnethy or Glendary, or under the barns of Beinach, to the Caplic water. Caplic water. But higher up the loch, there is no way out, save by scrambling up one or other of the burns that tumble from the heights, except that, above the shelter stone, a gap opens between the hills to Loch Etchichen, and here the scramble up is shorter. The inner end of this gash has been hawked straight from the granite. As one looks up from below, the agents would appear mere splashes of water, whose force might be turned aside by a pair of hands. Yet above the precipices, we have found in one of these burns pools deep enough to bathe in. The water that pours over these grim bastions carries no sediment of any kind in its precipitate fall, which seems indeed to distill and aerate the water, so that the loch far below is sparkling clear. This narrow loch has never, I believe, been sounded. I know its depth, though not in feet. I first saw it on a cloudless day of early July. We had started at dawn, crossed Cairn Gorm about nine o'clock, and made our way by the saddle to the lower end of the loch. Then we idled up the side, facing the gaunt quarry, and at last, when the noonday sun penetrated directly into the water, we stripped and bathed. The clear water was at our knees, then at our thighs. How clear it was, only this walking into it could reveal. To look through it was to discover its own properties, what we saw underwater had a sharper clarity than what we saw through air. We waded on into the brightness, and the width of the water increased, as it always does when one is on or in it, so that the loch no longer seemed narrow, 
but the far side was a long way off. Then I looked down, and at my feet there opened a gulf of brightness so profound that the mind stopped. We were standing on the edge of a shelf that ran some yards into the loch before plunging down to the pit that is the true bottom. And through that inordinate clearness, we saw to the depth of the pit. So limpid was it that every stone was clear. I motioned to my companion, who was a step behind, and she came and glanced as I had down the submerged precipice. Then we looked into each other's eyes and again into the pit. I waded slowly back into shallower water. There was nothing that seemed worth saying. My spirit was as naked as my body. It was one of the most defenseless moments of my life. I do not think it was the imminence of personal bodily danger that shook me. I had not then and have not, in retrospect, any sense of having just escaped a deadly peril. I might, of course, have overbalanced and been drowned, but I did not think I would have stepped down unawares. I and foot acquire in rough walking a coordination that makes one distinctly aware of where the next step is to fall, even while watching the sky and land. This watching, it is true, is of a general nature only, for attentive observation, the body must be still. But in a general way, in country that is rough but not difficult, one sees where one is and where one is going at the same time. I proved this sharply to myself one hot June day in Glen Cueach, when bounding down a slope of long heather towards the stream. With hardly a slackening of pace, eyes detected and foot avoided a coiled adder on which the next spring would have landed me. Detected and avoided also his mate at full length in the line of my side spring, and I pulled up a short way past to consider with amused surprise the speed and sureness of my own feet. Conscious thought had had small part in directing them. So, although they say of the River Avon that men have walked into it and been drowned, supposing it shallow because they could see its depths. I do not think I was in much danger just then of drowning, nor was fear the emotion with which I stared into the pool. That first glance down had shocked me to a heightened power of myself, in which even fear became a rare exhilaration. Not that it ceased to be fear, but fear itself, so impersonal, so keenly apprehended, enlarged rather than constricted the spirit. The inaccessibility of this loch is part of its power. Silence belongs to it. If jeeps find it out, or a funicular railway disfigures it, part of its meaning will be gone. The good of the greatest number is not here relevant. It is necessary to be sometimes exclusive, not on behalf of rank or wealth, but of those human qualities that can apprehend loneliness. The presence of another person does not detract from, but enhances the silence, if the other is the right sort of hill companion. The perfect hill companion is the one whose identity is for the time being merged in that of the mountains, as you feel your own to be. Then such speed as arises is part of a common life and cannot be alien. To make conversation, however, is ruinous. To speak may be superfluous. A habit from a gaunt elderly man, a lang tangle o a chiel, with high cheekbones and hollow cheeks, product of a hill farm, though himself a civil servant, that when he goes on the hill with chatterers, he could see them to an ill place. I have walked to myself with brilliant young people whose talk, entertaining, witty, and incessant, yet left me weary and dispirited because the hill did not speak. This does not imply that the only good talk on a hill is about the hill. All sorts of themes may be lit up from within by contact with it, as they are by contact with another mind 
and so discussion may be salted. Yet to listen is better than to speak. The talking tribe, I find, want sensation from the mountain, not in Keats' sense. Beginners, not unnaturally, do the same. I did myself. They want the startling view, the horrid pinnacle, sips of beer and tea instead of milk. Yet often the mountain gives itself most completely when I have no destination, when I reach nowhere in particular, but I've gone out merely to be with the mountain as one visits a friend with no intention but to be with him. That's the end of part two, The Recesses. Join us next time. I don't know when next time will be, so subscribe or keep an eye out on the channel um, for part three, The Group. Thanks for listening and take care.